as we go to your word, I ask as I speak would not be mine but yours, that they'd be spirit and truth and would not return void but would accomplish what you sent them to do. Give us listening ears and open hearts to receive your word. Let your word go deep within us and spring forth like a river of living water from our innermost being. And we praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, another reminder, uh, and we've already said this too, but we have, as people are kind of coming in and going out, we have communion at the end of this service plus ministry time. If you want to have hands laid on you and want to be anointed with oil, we'll do that at the end of the service. We're starting this morning on, uh, as I said, I guess this is the 12th segment on the grace of God. And my topic for the first part of this sermon, we'll see if I get to the second part because we're going to need to quit just a little bit early today. But uh, my topic for the first part is pride is still our worst enemy. And then there's another one we'll talk to about what's the appropriate response to grace if we get that far. And if not, I'll pick up on that next week. Here's what I want to talk about this morning. You remember in the... I've mentioned several times that, in my opinion, in my reading of it, the original sin in the book of Genesis was pride. Adam and Eve weren't content to have a relationship with God and have everything provided to them by God. They wanted to be God, right? And pride, hubris is another word for that, is, I believe, the besetting sin of the human race. If you took pride away from the occasion, we would have almost no other sins because almost everything results from this flaw within us that wants to be God rather than serve God. All right? And so once we get... Uh, born again, if, if that's the word you like to use, or we have a conversion, or however you want to explain it. We're indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe we've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And maybe, I hope, by the time we finish this series, a lot of people, some people, one person, will have gotten a revelation of the grace of God, which is another life-changing manifestation of the Holy Spirit when you really see grace down to your toenails it changes everything but even after we've done all those things or those things I should say have been done to us by God because we're not really responsible for any of them it takes God to do it but once we have had sundry and various revelations from God we are still tempted toward pride because it's just in our DNA and has been from the very beginning. And to, uh, in, a, in another one of those paradoxes or ironies, sometimes having powerful revelations from the Lord that change the way you see yourself and see God and see other people. Sometimes, if you're not super careful, that in itself produces pride. It's so typical for somebody who's had a great revelation to get puffed up in their own ego and think they got the revelation, they got the relationship because they're so special. Right, and, and it's all about them, and then they start lording it over everybody else. And so even when we see grace, there's always the temptation to turn grace into just another opportunity for our own hubris. And that's what I'm talking about this morning. Now, Paul tells us, St. Paul, who is sort of the author of the grace message. I mean, I preach more from St. Paul than anybody else because practically everything he ever wrote or talked about was regarding the grace of God. And he wrote half the New Testament. So if you read Paul's writings, it's all grace all the time. And it's a radical grace. This book that I've got coming out on grace, 
I, one of my early titles for it, I've changed the title three or four times because I can't decide what really encapsulates the, the message I'm trying to, to preach, but one of my early titles was Radical Grace, you know, because what Paul says is so powerful and so good, it's almost too good to believe. And Paul had this message, and despite all the power that he had and all the insight that he had, and he had the anointing of an apostle in the first century, he literally raised people from the dead, you know. He was bitten by a poisonous snake at one point and just pulled the snake off and threw it in the fire and went on about his business as if it was nothing. God sent earthquakes to deliver him from jail. I mean, you know, this is some powerful juju, right? I mean, this is some, this is some major stuff. And yet his life and his ministry, as he describes them, are a, a never-ending litany of persecutions, beatings, shipwrecks, illness, betrayal, imprisonment, and ultimately he is executed by the Romans, beheaded by the Romans for his faith. Now if God had the power to use Paul to raise somebody from the dead, if he had the power to send an earthquake to spring him out of jail and send, you know, do all the things that he did through Paul, he certainly, God I'm talking about, had the power to deliver Paul from all of these other trials and difficulties and illnesses and all the things he struggled with. But he didn't. And Paul was publicly flogged and he was humiliated and he had people who were set against him, even other Christians who were constantly stirring up trouble against him and saying all manner of evil against him. People were always mad at him, you know. And he, here he was, the walking, talking embodiment, the apostle of the grace of God, but also the power of God. And yet God allows him to go through all of these things. And Paul tells us that he prayed at least on three different occasions, and I suspect there was one prayer for each of his three missionary journeys because that's where he seemed to run into most of his problem was on his missionary journeys. And I think on each trip he must have prayed that God would deliver him from all of this and set him free because he knew that the devil was just having a field day beating up on him everywhere he went, and he knew that God had the power to squash the devil like a bug on a windshield, you know, and just set him free. And he says, I prayed three times that this would depart from me, that this messenger of Satan would be taken away from me, and I could just go on in peace. And each time, or maybe it was after the third time, God said to him, no. My grace is sufficient for you, and my power is perfected in weakness. And Paul says, so this messenger of Satan that followed me or preceded me everywhere I went and tormented me and stirred up trouble against me and made my life miserable a lot of the time, he said that messenger of Satan was allowed to come against me because of the overwhelming power of my revelation that I was had risen into the third heaven and seen things that man can't even speak of. And I don't think it's because God won't let you speak of it. It was because there is no human vocabulary to communicate the depth of what he saw. And so Paul says... If I had been left to my own devices, 
this surpassing greatness of the revelations God had given me and the power He had manifested through me would have turned me into a raging egomaniac. I would have lorded it over, I'm paraphrasing, but basically he says, I would have lorded it over everybody and I would have been puffed up in myself and I would have gotten caught up in my own pride like Satan himself did in heaven. He was so beautiful that he thought heaven belonged to him. He thought he was the master. He wanted to be in charge. That's where his fall came from. And Paul is saying, I probably would have done exactly the same thing if God hadn't let the devil consistently smack me around and keep me humble. The good news that we preach makes all kinds of profound statements about each of us Christians. It says we're saints. Vicki can turn around and look at Janet and say, Hi, Saint Janet, you know, because we're saints. It says we're children of God. It says we're joint heirs with Jesus. It says we're perfect. It says we're holy. It says we're righteous. It calls us sanctified. It says we're blameless. It says we're justified. It says we are the mirror images of Christ Himself. It says that we are temples of the Holy Spirit and our hearts are the holy of holies in the, in the temple of God, that we are where heaven meets earth. Heaven has come to earth through us. God is living his life through us. It calls us kings. It calls us priests. It says all of these amazing things uh, about us, and that's just who we are now. John says in 1 John chapter 3 that God's real glory for us hasn't been revealed yet and it remains to see, to be seen what we will be when Jesus returns. All of those things I just read are just the down payment on the real payment that's coming. Can somebody say amen? That's who you are. That's who I am. But the challenge is to remember day after day after day after day that absolutely none of the credit for our status before God, none of that saintliness belongs to us or is due to us or is based on anything you and I have done or haven't done. We're never to become impressed with ourselves. It's not about us. It's not as if we have earned any of this. It's that whatever glory is working through us, is manifested through us, all of it, 100% of it, is the work of God, not our own work. It's, It's... It's a blessing, a gift, a status that has been imparted to us by God on the basis of the work Jesus did. He has loaned us His glory. It's not about us. But our basic human tendency, our personality, our DNA, our genetic pool is wired such to constantly, all the time, think It's all about us. And God has blessed us because we're such wonderful little good girls and boys, you know, and we have just pleased Him so much. Oh, those poor sinners over there. I just don't know. You know, if they just knew Jesus like I know Jesus, you know, they wouldn't be acting such a fool, you know, if they'd had the revelation I've had, you know, you know, huh? Somebody said, I thought somebody said something. But, you know, and that's where we go. And this is exactly what Paul is talking about. God knows that's where we go. And that's why he allows us to get bumped around and knocked around and humiliated and put upon and lets us fail and all of these things is so that we can have a constant reminder of who we really are when left to our own devices. There's nothing mistaken about that. That's on 
purpose. And the people who have really seen into the depths of the Spirit and, and seem to know God on a much different level, they talk about this all the time. You know, I, I cite Richard Rohr a lot because he's somebody I, I just happen to be reading right now, and he's not a saint, and I'm not a saint, and nobody's a, a tr truce. We're all saints, and nobody's a saint. You know what I mean? We're all just people, and he's just a people. But one thing that he says that I have found interesting, and I've heard him say this now two or three different times in two or three different places. He says he prays every day for God to humiliate him at least once during the day. He prays for at least a humiliation a day. And that is a strange prayer to a lot of people. But I, I can see where he's coming from because what he's saying is, otherwise, I will start thinking it's about me. That all the things God has done through me is really about me rather than about him. So I need to have the baloney kicked out of me at least once a day. I have to fall flat on my face at something just to remind me where the power really comes from. You think about this, and you can see where God is coming from in this kind of setup. Some of you, most of you maybe, a lot of you, have had kids. All right? Well, we're God's kids. So imagine you've got a three-year-old son or daughter. I'll say son because I had a son. you got a three-year-old son. You know... If you've got a child, chances are, and particularly if you know the Lord, you probably love that child more than you love your own life. You would throw yourself in front of a bus for that kid. You would do anything. You'll sit up all night with them when they're sick. You hold their head when they vomit. You, when they mess themselves, you clean it up. You do everything. You would do anything. I had a moment, I remember one time, I've told this before, but it always pops in my head when I think about this. I had a moment with John, my son, one time when he was not much older than that, maybe five or six, something like that. And we were out in the backyard playing, and there was a fence that ran along the yard, and I had my back to the fence because I was playing ball with him or something. And all of a sudden, just out of nowhere with no warning, I heard the awfulest, it sounded like a grizzly bear running down through the yard. It was just like that. And John's eyes went like this, and he took off running. And I didn't know what was going on. I mean, it just came out of nowhere. And when I figured out about two seconds later what it was, it was a great big old dog that had come across the field behind our house. Fortunately for us, he couldn't get over the fence, and so he was just throwing himself up against the fence, but I thought he was about to eat us up. And the thing I noticed, the thing that stuck in my head, I've never forgotten this image was, when I came to myself and saw that it was a dog, I realized that in that split second between when the dog growled and John took off running, I had wheeled around toward the wild animal and was down in my fighting stance, you know, because I had put myself between the dog and John. I didn't think about it. It wasn't, you know, a decision I made. It was just instinct. I thought we were about to get eaten up, but the dog or whatever, the grizzly bear, whatever it was, was going to have to eat me before he got to John. You see what I mean? That's the kind of just visceral love we have for our children, mainly, most people do. You know, you will defend them with your life if you need to. But here's the thing. If you got this little three-year-old kid, it doesn't matter how much you love him. You may want him to grow up to be president of the United States. Well, that might not be a blessing. <laughs> you want him to be blessed in all he does. That's a lot of trouble there. But, you know, you want him to be a billionaire. You want him to be whatever. You want him to be happy in all he does. But what you can't do with a three-year-old is allow him to think he's the co-parent. He's a three-year-old, right? 
He is just a little walking, slobbering, crying ball of narcissism. Right? He thinks the entire world revolves around him. You can't let him be in charge because he will dash off the sidewalk right into the middle of traffic and get run over. You, you can't let him choose his diet because it will be all ice cream and chocolate milk three times a day. Right? You know things he doesn't. And if you let him think he's as powerful as you, you should go stay in a hotel. He'll slip out and climb off the balcony of a fifth-story floor room because he thinks he could fly like one of those superheroes he watches on TV. He has no sense. You love him. You want the best for him. But because you want the best for him, you also have to protect him. You have to stop him. You have to tell him no. You have to let him go through things. Sometimes you have to discipline him. You put him in time out or you take away his, you know, whatever they have now. Place, I don't know what, I can't even remember. My grandkids have gotten a little older now, but whatever a three-year-old has, what they, they have at that stage, sometimes you have to say, you do that again. That's going up on the shelf. And, you know, you, you're not going to be playing with that today. You have to get him in the right frame of mind. You have to have it foremost in his mind at that age that you're the parent and he's the child. You make the rules, he obeys the rules. And it's not because you're being mean, it's because you love him. Amen? It's because you care. And you know if left to his own devices, he will destroy himself if you, if you leave him alone. So this is for his... You, he needs the reminder that this is for his good. He's not as invincible as he believes. For his own health, he needs to be humbled. All right? Now, that is not the same, despite what Richard Rohr says, that's not the same as being, being humbled. It's not the same as being humiliated. I'm not talking about browbeating a kid or humiliating him. But you don't destroy him. You don't hurt him. You just keep their ego in check and help them see that they are just a kid and they don't know enough to be in charge, right? And you do that as, as loving a way as you can and you never hurt them, hurt them, but they need the reminder. You're three you're not 33, right? You don't get to decide all the time what you eat for breakfast. No, you can't have a 12th cookie. I'm sorry. We're going to eat a vegetable now. We're going to eat a carrot, you know. You can't, you can't do that. So this is kind of in, in a, hum, you know, in a not, not perfect example, but it's, it's kind of how God deals with us. Right, He knows how prone we are to making bad decisions. And the worst decision we make is to start thinking again that we have done something to deserve all his blessings and that God's obligated to bless us just because we're so wonderful, you know, and that we're better than all the people who haven't seen what we've seen and all of that other baloney that goes with us. And this is what Paul said. I, I mentioned this, but here's the actual quote. Here's what he said that God said to him when he said, God, I'm just getting beat all to the devil here. The devil's just having a field day on me. Could you rein him in? Can you do something about the devil? And, it's, and Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, but he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. 
Now get this. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When we come to the end of ourselves and there's nothing left of us, what is left is the unmitigated power of God. That's when the power of God starts really flowing through us. It's when we have come to the realization that there is nothing, yea, nothing good in us, and there's no power that's intrinsic to us, and if God doesn't do something, our goose is cooked, and we throw ourselves on him, Paul says, that's when we discover strength, the strength of God. We're at our strongest when we are at our weakness. Paul says that Power is perfected, uh, what was exactly how he said? Power is perfected in weakness. That word perfected in the Greek actually means more something like our word matured. He says power is matured in weakness. In other words, we grow up into God we start to mature. We start to move from what to cite Richard Rohr, Rohr might call the second half of life. We move from that into the first half. We, we move from the false self into the true self. Whatever words, whatever vocabulary you want to put on it doesn't matter. But we begin to grow up and find God in a whole new way and see ourselves and the Christian walk and everything about it in a whole new way when we have had the bean soup knocked out of us and there's nothing left of us. Can you say amen? amen? It's not a pleasant message, but it's a powerful message because it's true. <clears throat> Some years ago, many years ago, for part of my Christian walk, let's go back to the 1990s, let's say. <clears throat> I really believed, and in some ways I think I was, one of the most blessed people I knew, maybe the most blessed people I know, person I knew. I had this life where everything that could go good went better. There were no problems. Everything was booming. My career was booming. The church was booming. Had a wonderful marriage. Had a perfect son had great health, never had a serious health problem in my life. I mean, it couldn't get better. And I can remember, I was a grace man then. I got the revelation of grace in 1980, and this was way up in the 1990s. And I can remember as specifically, as, you know, as clearly as I know that I'm standing here today, how many mornings I would just wake up in the morning, I'd be laying there in my bed, and look up at the lower, you know, look up in the sky and say, Lord, I don't know what I did to deserve this, but thank you. I don't know what I did to deserve this life and this family and this church, but thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But you know, the key to that was, and the problem with that, and God isn't judging you for your words so much. I mean, he does pay attention to our words, but what I'm about to tell you didn't happen because I said that. I truly was grateful. You're right? But it wasn't until later I realized that part of what I was saying there explicitly, this was my morning prayer, and part of what I was saying was, Lord, I don't know what I've done, what I've done to deserve this. You catch that? You see that little thing there? Because at some level, if you had asked me, I just said, no, I haven't done anything to deserve this. But clearly from my own words, I thought I must be doing something right. I got the gospel down, right? Me and Jesus, we're tight, right? Because he's just blessing my socks off every way I turn and has been for years. And, and you know, I, 
what's the old song say? I'm, I feel sorry for anyone who isn't me tonight or whatever. You know, you know bless, bless the hearts of all those other people that are struggling out there. But God has just blessed my socks off. That's what, that's what I was saying. And at some level, I was still in the Adam and Eve thing. I still thought it was about me, right? That in some level, I wasn't just being blessed by God. I kind of was God, I guess, because, you know, everything was going right. And then, as many of you know, and I won't go into a great deal of detail. Most of you know the story. I've heard it a thousand times. But the bottom just in 2000, boy, 20th century was good to me. (laughs) 21st century, well, that started off with a, with, in a whole different direction. And everything that I held dear just about just went right down the tubes. And, you know, everything. My wife got cancer and she was dying. I became a caregiver. And boy, I wasn't cut out to be a caregiver, but I was giving it my best every day. Got burned out doing that. Got de- got it depressed, fell into depression, the church fell apart. I mean, everything. It was just like <clears throat> I used to tell somebody, I don't remember who it was, it's like I f- the floor collapsed <clears throat> and I fell through and landed in the basement on my head and just about the time I finally got would get my head together and think, whoo, I'm glad that's over, then the basement floor would collapse and I'd fall down to some level beneath that and it just went on and on and on and on and I found myself saying guess what I said Lord what have I done to deserve this I still thought after all that time I still thought it was about me right I must have done something really bad that I didn't even know I do did because you used to bless me so much and now you're not blessing me in anything at all and what did I do What did I do? Show me what I did, and I'll make it right. And I realized at some point along in that journey in the last 20 years since then that there was a lot more me left in me than I thought there was. You ever had that experience? I clearly, I thought when I was blessed, it was because I was doing some great things. When I was seemed to be cursed, I thought it was because I must have unknowingly done something really, really bad that ticked God off. And what I have learned in the years since then is we live in a fallen world. John Prine says that's the way the world goes around. You're up one day, the next you're down. You're in a half an inch of water and you think you're going to drown. That's the way the world goes round, right? And that's the way the world goes round. Bad things happen and good things happen too. But what God wants to do is get us to the point that we realize our relationship with him is not dependent on whether we're in the good spot or the bad spot. He is equally there in the light and in the darkness, the scripture says. David said, where would I go to get away from you? If he talks about all the different places on earth that he could go, distant places. And he says, well, when I get there, you're there. And then he says, and even if I descend into hell, I discover, or the Sheol, the land of the dead, that when I get there, you're already there. You were there before me. And so what God wants us to know is that our relationship with him, A, does not depend on us, and B, is no reflection of the circumstances, good or bad. He's equally there in our lives in the good times, and he's equally there in the bad times. We live in a fallen world when things, terrible things will happen sooner or later to almost everybody. It just does. You know? And what I discovered through the last 20 some years is that I wasn't as spiritual as I thought. I wasn't as smart as I thought. 
I wasn't as tough as I thought. I wasn't as moral as I thought. I wasn't any of those things. What I have learned is I was a loser and I still am. That none of us can do any of it on our own. And to whatever extent you think you're better than anybody in any situation, you are deluding yourself. All you need is a different set of circumstances, and you'll find out that you're no better than anybody. You're as weak as anybody. And the only hope that you have in this world or the world to come is the grace of God. That's the only hope. But what I also learned is the Lord was with me the whole time. I went for a number of years where I didn't know where God had gone. I'm like, where are you, God? I didn't feel God. I didn't see God. I didn't see God working in my life. And I was the preacher. God help all you all. I don't know. You know, I just, like, I was doing my best. I stayed faithful. You know, that's the only thing I can say, is, that, and that was the Lord, too. But I had no evidence that God was there. I had no feeling that God was there. And But now, in retrospect, I can see, you know how you can see better in the rearview mirror sometimes, you know? And I look back and I realize he was there the whole time. He never left. He was there the whole time. And this saying came to me. I don't think I've ever heard this anywhere else. I don't think I stole it from anybody, but it's, all, it's too good to be from me, but I don't think I stole it. But what I realized at some point was that even when I didn't believe in him anymore, he still believed in me. And he didn't believe in me because he thought I was such a fine guy that he was sure I could handle anything life threw at me. He knew I couldn't handle diddly squat. I didn't know that, but I found out, right, that all the stuff that I thought of. You ever said this about anybody else? You see somebody in a difficulty and you think, well, I don't know why they're handling it that way. Boy, if that was me, I'll tell you what I'd do. You ever said that? Well, God help you. You have absolutely zero idea what you would do till you're in that situation. You would be hanging on by your fingernails, just praying not to fall off into the fire, right? And that's where I ended up. And so God didn't, he didn't have faith in me because he knew I was such a great guy that I could handle it. He had faith in me because he knew he was controlling the situation and he was not going to let me fall. So he knew I was going to make it because he wasn't going to let me fall. That's what Jesus said to Peter. Remember when he told Peter he's going to deny him. He said, Peter, you're going to deny me and not just once. You're going to deny me three times. But when you have returned, strengthen the brethren. Use this situation to help everybody else. He knew Peter was going to deny him, but he also knew Peter wasn't going to fail because he wasn't going to let him fail, you know. And he was going to be sifted like wheat, but he wasn't going to be down and out because God wouldn't let him go that far. That's where the confidence comes from is God knows us, unfortunately, but he knows himself too. And he's like, I got Vicky. She's mine. She's going to go through a tough patch, but she won't fail because I won't let her fail. I'm just going to let her learn she can't succeed on her own. But I'll make sure she doesn't fall. The scripture says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Isn't that beautiful? He loved me as fully when I was doubting and grieving and furious as when I was shouting praises in the sanctuary. Same God in all those circumstances. He didn't care what anybody else thought about me. Thank God for that. He didn't even care what I thought about myself. He knew his plans for me. And he knows his plans for you. And he's bringing you to that point where you will recognize his grace. You know, 
He said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. My mother always said that's why she didn't fly in planes. She did, refused to fly. She said, the scripture says, Lo, I am with you. <laughs> Not at 30,000 feet. So she said, as long as I'm down here, the Lord's with me. But I think he's with you even up there, right? You know, and he's, he's with us in all circumstances that of our lives. He is working even through the bad stuff because he's always working his grace in our lives. But one of the preconditions for grace is we have to understand that it's grace and it's not us. And the only way we can do that is to fail. And then when we start getting that message, guess what? Circumstances start changing. It doesn't mean everything becomes perfect, but when our minds change and our hearts change, circumstances start changing. And you see that presence of the Lord coming back, but you're different. You know what I mean? Like the good stuff comes back. You know, I, I had just two or three things happen this week that just reminded me of God's love and his grace and his mercy in my life and how he's been there the whole time. I had a situation where I went out to eat to a place, a long story, and we don't have time for the whole story, but the gist of the thing is I went out to eat, and I ended up eating at a place where I didn't intend to go, you know, and I thought, oh, I don't want to go there. It's just me by myself. I think the house cleaner was at the house, and Liz was gone, and I just had to, you know, vacate the house for a while, so I went to this restaurant. Didn't want to be there at, at the time. And uh, the waitress came up, and I use those times like that to just commune with the Lord, you know. And I had taken my, I got this little journal, this little spiritual journal. It looks kind of like a New Testament, but it's, it's about that size, but it's a little bit fancier looking. And the, the server came up and was waiting on me, and she said, like, what's well, a really pretty journal there. She said, I really like that journal. And I said, well, thank you. Do you, you write in a journal? We got in this conversation and it turned out that she was a Christian and she'd been journaling. And this led to this whole conversation and just this really sweet conversation. And she wants a copy of my new book on grace when it comes out. She said, I'll buy it. I'll buy that. I said, no, I'll give it to you. You know, let me, when I get it in print, I'll come back to the restaurant. I'll find you. I'll give you a copy of it. And it was just this whole beautiful moment. And, and when I walked out, it's like this little light bulb went off over my head. And I thought, I didn't even intend to be there. But the Lord controls even where we go to eat. Amen. Lo, I'm with you always, he says. And that means in the peaks and in the valleys. Well, I got to stop. We got to do communion and prayer time. But has everybody got a communion cup? Everybody got? Oh, okay. Well, I guess you do then. We're, <laughs> we've all got one. We're gonna, we'll do it this way then. We'll file past. Are we going to hand them out or are we going to? Where's Marty? How are we doing it? Come on.